All right, so welcome to You Can Judge a Book by Its Cover. Uh, I'm Joe Monson. I'll be moderating the panel. Uh, we're going to go around briefly and just have everybody introduce themselves. Uh, take 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, we'll start with Christy, then go to Scott, and then Dan. Hi, I'm Christy S. Gilbert from Loose Leaf Editorial and Production, and I'm a book editor and designer specializing in science fiction and fantasy. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. Uh, and when I'm not editing, then I also teach a an intro to print publishing class about uh, graphic design principles and how to use design software at BYU. My name is Scott Tarbett. I am a uh, writer of speculative fiction. I do a lot of steampunk, um, science fiction, a little bit of paranormal, um, and I help other people get um, get their novels on the way, especially beginning writers. My name is Dan Herring. My background is in animation, and I currently work in video games. In 2019, I published my first book. I co-wrote it and illustrated it, and I was able to do the cover design as well. Sure, and editor and writer, so I kind of have experience across all of them. Um, just really quick. We'll go over a couple questions, and then we're going to go into a slideshow where we're talking about specific covers and what things work and what things don't on them. Um, are there just generally uh, some items on covers that make them more appealing than others? Um, we'll start with Dan on this one. Um, I mean, there are definitely things that draw my attention more than others um and a lot of that is geared towards what what kind of books i'm looking for i tend to read a lot of fantasy science fiction a lot of graphic novels things like that so i tend to look for those those sort of things and if the artwork is well done i'm, I'm a bit, big fan of artwork so if it's well done and professional looking then that'll let me at least take a second look at it so i don't know about particular images, but just uh, well done artwork draws me in. OK. SD Scott? Um, like, I don't think that you can universally answer that question. <laughs> uh, there are lots of trends in design. There are differences in genre. Like, uh, like Dan mentioned, there are things that appeal to me more than others, but uh, what a book cover should do is not necessarily look pretty. I mean, yes, we want it to look pretty, but like its primary goal is to sell the book to the right reader. It's not even necessarily to sell the book. It's to it's to tell you, reader who likes this type of book, this is the type of book you like. It's enough like those other things you like that you want to buy it, but it's different enough that it's going to be fun. And that's really what a cover should be doing. So if it's a romance cover and it's a sweet romance cover, then that's going to, the best way for that book to show up on the shelf is gonna be different than an erotica cover. And that's even within the same broad category of books. And the way an epic fantasy looks should be different than the way a hard SF book looks. And the things that are, I think we've got to lock up. Lost her stream there. So, yeah. Scott, do you yeah. want to? Um, I, the the first rule for me, um, and this is speaking from the standpoint of somebody who who takes um, other authors' books on on consignment and takes them to various conventions and 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 cons, is that it's got to shout the genre. Um, and then it's got to be it's got to be something that somebody just wandering past, and this goes for on a, a book at a, or a table at a convention, as well as sliding past it in um, in social media or on Amazon. It's got to catch somebody's eye. Now the production 
within those parameters. I've seen some really amateur, very crudely done, um, as far as artwork, covers that really work uh, within their genre. And I've seen some, um, some really artistically done covers that just absolutely fall flat. When we, when we get into the, when we get into the uh, slideshow presentation piece of our, of our talk here, I'll, I've given Joe one of my covers that, that the cover fails. The book got all sorts of critical acclaim, but because the cover was a fail, it doesn't sell well. All right. So Christy cut off while you were in the middle of saying something. Um, do you have any additional stuff you were talking about uh, making sure that the cover uh, fits the genre and stuff like that? Right. So I don't know exactly when it cut off, but I'll just wrap up by saying like covers should let readers know that it's a book they're going to love. Well, that makes it a lot easier on readers. Her at least. Yeah, it looks like her stream may be fitting sure. in and out. So, um, okay. so basically, it sounds like she's uh, saying that it should represent what the, the genre is so that people don't get confused picking up a sweet romance-looking cover and finding out that it's epic fantasy because those covers tend to look significantly different. So, for example. So uh, let's go ahead and just go into the slideshow and we'll let the, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can see those images. Um, I don't know if the producer has to do anything really quick, but I'm going to do that really fast and see if it works. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and make that full screen. Uh, let me know if it messes up on the streaming side or something. So. So what book should I look up on the on Google <laughs> for us to talk about? Okay. There's one, the one that's showing is called The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. Okay. So on the cover of this one, it shows a soldier, pretty obviously a soldier, um, walking through the jungle. Uh, you can tell that it's kind of science fiction-y because it doesn't look like any normal today uh, soldier stuff exactly. It looks kind of futuristic. Uh, let me know when you guys can see it. I'm getting lots of images coming up on the Forever War. Is it the one with like the sans serif font that's all left aligned? Yeah. And the blurb is centered at the top? Yes. Okay. All right. I found it. It's up on the screen, the uh, stream. So, yeah. So if you bring up the stream somewhere, you can see it there too. So. Okay, well. um, so this particular one is military science fiction. Uh, what do you guys think as far as the cover? Does this work? Does it not work? It works as military sci-fi. It says says all of that right away. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, because it's got like it's got a soldier on it, so it's mm -hmm. like this is military so it sends a very clear signal with that and where it's got like this bold sans serif font that's very common in yeah, I mean, thrillers the, uh, that are military related and things like that and see that it's a, not a normal looking soldier something science fiction um some kind of outfit so it definitely reads that it's right off the bat yeah. yep so as far as the font choices and stuff do those work on here Yeah, that that tall, thick sans serif look that you get, you see that on a lot of military thrillers and a lot of science fiction as well. This is, I, I can't hear if anyone else is talking, so I'm. <laughs> Am I muted? Um, the, no, I can uh, hear you. The yellow. Okay. Okay. Um, the yellow on Forever kind of gets lost mm -hmm. in the background above his head. Um, so as far as font, I. I'm not the one to talk to. I'm not a, a graphic designer. Um, I think um, Christy probably has a lot more to say about that. But just as, as far as visuals from across the room, that's going to kind of get lost mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. It's it's me. Me. It that says to me that it needs so. to, a cover 
is more, or the, the titles on a cover are more effective if they're high contrast mm -hmm. and able to be seen from a ways away. If I can take my, if I can expand on that from the standpoint of a bookseller with, when I, when I take consignments to cons and whatnot, I, I figure a book has maybe two, maybe as long as three seconds to grab a, a passerby's eye with the cover. And if it doesn't do that, that's as far as it's going to go. If, I, if we can accomplish that, we get them to pick it up or in Amazon to click on it and flip it over and read the back. If, if that part of the cover is good, then they may open it and get the whiff of new book smell and read a little sample of our deathless prose inside. But the first step has got to be grabbing them from, from a body length away. Right. So uh, let's try a different <coughs> here. Um, the program I'm using, for whatever reason, decides to mix them up in a weird order. So I don't know which one's going to come up next, but we will see which one comes up next. We can get it to do that. We'll just go to the top here. Uh, looks like this is Scott's. So, uh, Scott, do you want to talk about yours and tell us what you think works and what doesn't work about your cover? Which one is it? Uh, your cover, the Dragon Moon. Dragon Moon. Okay. There's my fail. Um. <laughs> Hold on, let me get the, oh, I can reach behind me on the shelf and grab this one um, so that I can be looking at what you're looking at. Um, this is, this is Thriller. It has a, it has a heavy hard science fiction element to it. And nothing in this cover, which was done by a publisher, nothing in this cover says any of that except the little the little title at the top the ultimate high ground and even that makes the viewer look at it and think what does that have to do with a chinese dragon i've i've had people email me and say hey there's there's no dragons in your book well yeah <laughs> it's not about dragons it's about a space mission it's about a mission to the moon by the Navy SEALs. Um, so that, that to me is a fail. It's a gorgeous graphic. It's a beautiful graphic. I love the graphic. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't shout out the, the genre. And even though it's visually appealing, it doesn't get you to the point point where you want to flip it around and, and see the back of it and figure out what what's actually inside it. So that to me is a fail. And it shows in in the in the sales figures. This is, this book sells, but not as well as some some of my titles with with better covers. All right. So Christy or Dan, can you see that cover? I'm sorry, yeah. say that again. Okay. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, just the last um, couple of times I've talked, no one's been able to hear me, I thought. Just from a, a layman's perspective, it does Dan. look like sci-fi font. Like, uh, I would look at the font itself and be like, okay, that's kind of science fiction-y, speculative. But then the juxtaposition of the fire dragon would just kind of throw me. So, Okay, Christy? Um, yeah, I think that that seems to me like a cover that was made by someone who maybe didn't know what was in the book <laughs> so i think this like because uh, i mean it's beautiful if you're looking for a book that's about dragons but you say it's, it's not about dragons it's just called dragon moon and so i think this could be really helpful if you're self-publishing make sure you give a clear brief to your cover designer or pay them enough to read your book before they make your cover 
Um, like make sure they understand the tone, the the basic outlay of like what happens and and who you're trying to appeal to. Give them comp titles. Tell them what other books are like your book. Don't just be like, this is called Dragon Moon. And then they'll be like, okay, I'll put a fiery dragon in front of a moon with like a sci-fi font. And I mean, that's great, but it doesn't match the book. And so it's not going to tell the right readers that this book is what they want. Right. Right. Dead on. So this is one that I just found. Um, what do you think about this cover? We'll start with um, Christy this time. Now, this one is called A Brief History of the Dead by Kevin Brockmeyer, B-R-O-C-K-M-E-I-E-R. And it, uh, it's a black and white cover. So. Do, that's do creepy. The other, yeah. Can they either either of the other two of you see that? I can see it. Okay, go ahead. What do you think about that, Scott? Um, I I would look at that and I would say immediately it it's paranormal. It might even be horror, not just from the word dead in the in the title, but. Uh, the empty coat with hands grip, gripping the lapels. There's there's high creep factor there. Um, not knowing anything else about the book, I I assume that it's either one of those. It's it's either paranormal or it's horror. That is a paranormal one. Oh, yeah, Christy, were that. you able to bring that up? Yes, I can see it now. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's great. It's got like a really simple imagery. And it's easy to read the text. We've got that high contrast that we were talking about on the military SF cover where you lost it on the forever word, but like you've got enough contrast to read the words. The imagery is unsettling enough that you want to look at it longer because you're like, wait, what? There's there's hands, but no body. And so that that keeps a reader looking at it for longer than those like two to three seconds that that Dan mentioned. And that that's super helpful and it i mean it it doesn't convey like a like it conveys paranormal but to me this book doesn't say we're gonna be like werewolves and vampires staking them all like it's a it's like a action fighty type of paranormal it kind of looks like it's gonna be a little more literary but it is going to unsettle you so if that's what this book does, I think it's an this cover does an amazing amazing job of conveying that. It, it says to me, especially with the wording of the title, it says to me that it's got its tongue in its cheek, mm -hmm. which is appealing to me. I don't read a lot of paranormal, and I've only written paranormal um, by uh, by invitation. Um, but I would pick that book up and look at it. That I, I think that's worth mentioning as well. This seems like it's looking for more of a crossover audience. Um, so it's taking elements of one type of genre cover and mixing them with those that are typical of a different genre cover and putting them together so that it will appeal to both. That sort of crossover design can fail. It can end up not appealing to either audience at all. But it can be really good if you've got a book that is going to appeal to more than one type of genre audience trying to look at the, both those genres and taking elements and aspects and putting them into the same book cover. I agree. Looks like we lost Dan for a bit. I don't know if he'll be back. So, um, The next book cover that I'm bringing up is called Hippocrates and the Hobgoblin by C.S. Colvin, C-O-L-V-I-N. And welcome back, Dan. Thank you. Technology is awesome when it works. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this one is, it... is kind of a monotone cover with yellow bars on it. Sure. Is it the one with like the angel or the one with just like the woodcut of the helmet? Uh, it's the one with the, the Greek angel. I okay. Guess. I All right. So. Got it. I'm looking so, at it. <laughs> uh, this one I got off a 
website called lousybookcovers.com. Um, the comments there were, the art is fantastic. This kind of goes back to what one or more of you said earlier. The art is fantastic on this one, but it's kind of hard to read. So mm -hmm. do you guys have any input? We'll start with Dan since he's back now. Um, oh, thank you. Um, it is hard to read, definitely. Um, and I'm also wondering what the point of that uh, transparency on the lower third is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's not making it easier to read. It's just covering part of the image. So that's really confusing to me. Yeah, maybe if they moved the title down into that transparency part, it would make the title easier to read, too. Right, yeah, but as it is, it's just just odd to me, and I don't really like the uh, the yellow stripe at the top either. Is there a mm -hmm. yellow border all the way around? I can't really tell. Yeah, it looks like a really thin yeah, one. I'm not a, yeah. I mean, not digging that. I don't mind so much the yellow stripes at the bottom, but the border all the way around doesn't <laughs> do it for me. <laughs> all right. So Scott, what the what art is cool though. Yeah. Yeah, the, the art is definitely cool. This I this I think falls into the category of someone who loved the art so much and was trying to tell the story on the cover. Mm -hmm. Um which which is a really common failing, especially among uh self published people who are doing or directing their own covers. Um and uh, looking at that, I just don't, I don't see the appeal to a specific genre. I don't know a genre where the person's going to walk by and look at that and they think, oh, there's a, there's a book for my genre. I'm going to look at it and see if I want it. The art is beautiful. The artist clearly knows what they're doing. Uh, like we've said, the text is difficult to read. I think it's too small. I think it's the wrong color for that cover. But something about the art, and I see this a lot in self-published books that art doesn't actually leave a space for the words. Yeah. Like you can't make them very big on that art. You're gonna end up covering that guy's face or you're gonna end up covering what they're, what that guy's stabbing, which already there's words covering what he's stabbing. Like, And there's no big empty space on the side. Like if you look at um, the or Priory of Orange or something, I don't know. It's got like a tower and a dragon on it, but there's like this big empty space on the right where all the words go. Um, there are really amazing artists out there who, if they haven't thought about the composition necessary to create a book cover, aren't good for book covers. A lot of them can learn fairly quickly because if they understand art and they understand composition, then making that pivot isn't hugely difficult. But it's very important if you're commissioning your own art that you evaluate a portfolio based on their ability to make compositions that are appropriate for what you're doing. That art is gorgeous. I, I couldn't make an excellent book cover out of it. I could make a eh, a serviceable book cover out of it um, just because there isn't a good place to put the words without taking away from that beautiful art. The only way that I could see is if it was a framed piece. Yeah, if you could you frame it. Art where you have blocks of solid color at the top or the bottom mm -hmm. and you have all the wording in there. But that's really the only way this one would work well, just because the art is so busy, it would be very difficult and is obviously looking at the title. The, to the art even also read has anything on it. So yeah, the art also has a lot of high contrast. Like there's really, really bright mm -hmm. parts and really, really dark parts. So you yep. can't just make the text dark or the text light. You're yep. gonna have to find some sort of contrasting color that will stand out on top of those. And that's it's hard. It's not un, it's not impossible, but it is harder. Yeah, this is this is an example of a really really common failing where where the the author I bet has fallen in love with a piece of art, maybe has commissioned the piece of art and they love it, it but it just doesn't work for a cover. All right. So this next one was one suggested by Christy. Uh, it's called "The Hum and the Shiver" by Alex Bledsoe. Uh, Christy, since you suggested this one. I could talk about, about it, it even what if I can't you... find it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this cover of The Hum and the Shiver, I think this is a really instructive cover for self-published authors because this uses one piece of custom photography and two pieces of stock photography. 
And um, you could probably find another piece of doc photography that would work for the custom. So the image of the woman that is in front with the violin, that is a custom piece of photography. They paid a photographer to go out and do that. Um, but if you're can if you're combining different stock photos, it's really important to be able to get them to combine well. If the lighting is significantly different in those different stock photos, or if the color mixing and the tone is significantly different, they're not going to mesh. And even if they're all good photos, they don't belong together. <laughs> For this, they've taken that image of the woman and they've put her in front of a landscape and they've kind of faded her a little bit so she blends with the landscape. The blues and the oranges in the landscape do not clash with any of the dark colors that are in that image of the woman. And then we have the stock imagery of the bird. And I know this because you can open up, this is good research if you're trying to figure out how covers are done. You can hide, it's not a thriller. So they're not giving us like intense, blocky, crammed together letters. There's lots of openness. It's a very like moody literary book. So you can kind of get that feel. It's very atmospheric. It's set in Appalachia. So we get those mountains. We get that kind of like moody atmosphere from the imagery of the woman. And I think it does a really good job of conveying the tone of the book, even though it doesn't really represent a character. The main character doesn't play the violin. She plays some sort of niche instrument. Um, and putting that on the cover would probably distract people more. They'd be like, what instrument is that? I don't know what that is. Rather than just saying, this is a book that incorporates music and landscape in an atmospheric way. And when you see this on a fantasy bookshelf, then that tells you something about the book and helps communicate to readers that this is the book that you want. Or stay away from this because you want some shoot 'em up sci-fi go find something else for you, shoot them up sci-fi, because this is going to be way too slow for you. <laughs> All right. So, um, Dan, did you have any thoughts on this one? Uh, I had a question for Christy, because um, so often I see self-published books or self-designed book covers with uh, fonts that have serifs. Is there a rule about that? Because usually they look, they don't look good when they have serifs. This one looks <laughs> great, but I'm wondering like your thoughts on that. I think part of that is uh, because of what serif they're choosing. Like in epic fantasy, serif fonts are very, very common. Like Trajan and Carrig Pro, those are very, very common and they help convey the genre. But a lot of times people just end up using like Times New Roman, which was invented for newspapers. So it doesn't, it doesn't look like it belongs on a sci-fi book. It looks like it belongs on a newspaper. So a lot of it is, I don't think it's serif versus sans serif. I think it's matching the font to the genre more than anything else. And with this, it's it's got more modern contemporary feel. Those serifs are very thin. It doesn't look like it was invented for a newspaper. Um, this one is called Hilda the Wicked Witch, Snow White Revisited by Paul Cater. Uh, it uses a copyrighted character. Uh, the character design, because Snow White is not copyrighted, but this particular design is. And so, I mean, I, I don't know what all of you will have to say about this other than don't do this. But, <laughs> but, I'm, I'm amazed I could find an image online and Disney hadn't hadn't sent a <laughs> cease and desist on to Smashwords even. Yeah, this this might out. even be like a vacation photo or something. So. Let's take a picture of Snow White. 10 years ago yeah. and still up. Yep. Um, so this, I, I mean, beyond just don't use copyrighted characters, especially with a particularly litigious company, that's just not smart. Um, uh, make sure you understand the licensing of any imagery you're using. You might search for like a free stock photo, but then uh, the free stock photo is only free for personal use. So if you sell that book, it's not free anymore. You need to pay that artist who took that photo. Um, yep. So, And maybe you have exclusive rights to use a custom piece of art for about a year, and then the artist has the right to resell that afterward. And if that's in your contract, then don't get mad when the artist continues to sell their work in other ways. Like, Make sure you read your contracts and understand what terms you've agreed to in using that piece. Yep. So, and uh, a word on behalf of all of the freelance cover artists out there 
commissioning cover art is pretty cheap. A, a good cover, a good cover has cost me $300 or less um, versus, versus spending two or three days of your own time with your own Photoshop skills cobbling together a failure. Or MS Paint. Or MS Paint. <laughs> yeah. So as, aside, putting the copyrighted nature of this particular image aside, uh, or the, at least the content of the image, um, what about the cover itself? the design of the cover. Uh, we'll start with Dan on that one. I don't really know where to start. Um, there's a lot that I would call wrong with this cover. Um, the thing that jumps out to me first is why Revisited is not capitalized. Yes. But, um, you know, there's plenty of other stuff. Uh, it just, you know... It got Hilda the Wicked Witch. Something that that I've noticed, and this has nothing to do with cover design. Well, it kind of does because, like, so many self-published books are like book title colon the such and such chronicles colon blah blah blah. Like they they have these super long titles, and then they try to cram this all onto one. Or it's like make sure you making sure you know it's part of this series. So this is part of the Hilda the Wicked Witch series, but. I don't know that. Like I know that because I've looked at it um, a little more in depth. But Hill of the Wicked Witch, Snow White Revisited, is that the title of the book? Like it's just it's just a kind of a mishmash of all these words that don't really tell me a whole lot. I don't know who Hilda is. I know who Snow White is. I don't know why we're revisiting her. So and that again, that's more to do with like the title than the actual design. But trying to cram so many words into the, the cover is really bothersome to me. Yeah, I think the hierarchy is off on this. If Hilda the Wicked Witch is the series title, um, there needs to be a lot stronger contrast between like showing the series title and showing the book title. If you look mm -hmm. at book series that have the series title and the and the book title on the same cover, like if that's what you're trying to do, go look at a bunch of book covers that do that and see how they do it. They typically have the book title really, really big and then smaller with some like spaced out text underneath it. They give you the series title or sometimes it's above, but they're close to each other. But there's a distinct difference between the way you're doing the words for the series and the way you're doing the words for the book. Um, so one of my biggest takeaways from this is just do your research. Go hang out in Barnes and Noble or your local bookstore or on Amazon and look at books that do the same stuff you're doing. If you have a series, look at how series do it. Go look at, it looks like there's like 23 books in this series. Go look at Terry Pratchett's Discworld and see how they handle Discworld and how they present those on the cover. Right. So I think we're probably um, at the end of our time. Uh, do each of you want to take just 30 seconds to a minute and give any last thoughts on the topic? We'll start with Dan, go to Scott, and then end with Christy. Um, just to echo what Christy said, I mean, do your research. It's so easy to go on Amazon. Maybe you can't get to Barnes & Noble, but go on Amazon. Look at books that your book is in the same genre as. Look at what. Look at successful books. And you can get a lot of information from that. If you just design from the ground up and don't take into account all the work that so many other designers have done, you're going to kind of be, you know, in bad shape. And like Scott mentioned, you go on Fiverr, you can sp pay somebody 50 bucks to design something if you're not confident in your skills. There are definitely ways to come up with a good cover. Don't Don't assume that because you know the book best, and you love the book best that automatically it makes you a graphic designer or a book marketer. Um, get help. It, if you just want to throw it out there and, and even really good independent authors, Michael Brent does this. Michael Brent Collings does this, throws out different versions of a cover that he is self-designing and has all of his fans help him refine it. Get get input from people who know what they're talking about. Get input from your market. 
if you can possibly do so. Don't try and do it alone just because you you love the book so much because you'll hurt it. Mm-hmm. For a second, I thought you were going to say get feedback from your mom. I was like, well, she's going to say she likes it no matter what. So. <laughs> That's her job. <laughs> um, I, I would also add to, to the research, to getting feedback, um, try to find comp titles that are recent. Uh, if you're at, or or know what you're doing. Like if you're like, oh, my book is like Lord of the Rings and Dune and you look at the original Lord of the Rings and Dune covers and design based on that, you're going to get a certain audience. And it might not be people who want new fiction inspired by Dune, but that it has a more contemporary feel. If you if they're looking for something exactly like Dune, great. Um, but even Dune has gone through different iterations to try to capture new audiences over time because what designs resonate with an audience change over time and they change depending on taste. And so try to find comp titles that are recent so you can understand what design is doing today. All right. So uh, thank you everybody for participating in this panel, um, despite all our technical difficulties. And thank you to Dan and Scott and Christy for uh, participating and sharing your expertise with us.